Good evening, dear guests, friends, and honorable speakers. Um, I am Yarena Boychuk, the director of Uku Business School, and I'm honored to present and moderate one of the panels of our conference. Uh, here with um, uh, here we are with our great speakers uh, to think, talk, discuss uh, the topic of responsible business as the resource for national resilience. We have an um, hour and a half for our discussion, uh, questions from uh, you, our guests, uh, answers from our speakers and final conclusions. I suggest that while uh, our guests will answer the specific questions I have for them, you uh, you can post your own questions or thoughts in our Zoom chat so that I could announce them later, but not too late. And now I want to start with the introduction of our speakers. I, I invited them very carefully so that we can see as bigger picture in this topic of business responsibility as it is possible to obtain in uh, one hour. So here they are. Please welcome uh, John, George Anderle, Professor Emeritus of International Business Ethics at the Mendoza College of Business and concurrent professor in the Keogh School of Global Affairs, University of Notre Dame, Indiana, USA. Professor conducts research on the ethics of globalization, wealth creation, business and human rights, corporate responsibility of large and small companies, the results of which are included in his book, Corporate Responsibility for Wealth Creation and Human Rights, published in 2021, and co-edited book, Ethical Innovation in Business and uh, the Economy. Uh, George also was a co-founder of the European Business Ethics Network and the president of the International Society of Business, Economics and Ethics. Thank you, Professor, for joining us. Thank you. Uh, oh, we have Andrei Kostyuk also here, so welcome. Andrei Kostyuk, a partner at Pavlenko and Partners, attorneys at uh, law, president of the Nexia Ukraine, member of Lviv Region Bar Association, lecturer in the Department of uh, Philosophy of the Ukrainian Catholic University and Ku Business School. With the profound experience as corporate lawyer, Andrei teaches uh, courses that include also Catholic social teaching. Welcome, Andrei. Uh, Oleg Lagodienko, a businessman, member of the boards in several companies and NGOs, the founder and CEO of Ethicontrol, member of executive committee at Ukrainian Network of Integrity and Compliance. And Roman Vashchuk, Canadian diplomat, ambassador of Canada to Ukraine from 2014 to 2019. Now Roman is the business ombudsman in the Ukraine, in Ukraine and a good friend of Uku. Welcome, Roman. So, dear speakers, thank you for coming. Uh, and I would like us to focus uh, in our discussion on the future Ukraine in general and business role or, or its responsibility for recovering and building our country into a prosperous state with dignified and happy people. Within and around the business school, we have developed and uh, keep very close relations with Ukrainian business, either small, middle or big companies and entrepreneurs. Our community include, uh, we counted uh, close to 1000 businesses in Ukraine, and I believe. And from the first hours when the full invasion in February 2022 began, we saw how business and people uh, in it took their active role fully supporting our resistance. They helped uh, our military, the refugees, um, their employees with the families and even other businesses and foundations at the same time. Uh, also, business also su suffered significantly either from the direct invasion or the economical consequences but uh, still we know that most of them never gave up till now. There were moments when they forgot even about profits, efficiency, and other aspects that business is usually associated with. We have learned a lot about ourselves through this difficult year and about resilience and values, our values, 
on the personal and institutional level. And I know that business did also learn a lot. So here I will give the floor to Oleg Lahodiyenko to have the word on behalf of Ukrainian business. Oleg, from your experience of this year in war, was this huge lift of business responsibility and unity in the face of danger for the uh, country occasional, or it is a big shift of attitude among our businesses that will stay with us from now on? So it's like, would business become a resource for our national resilience for future Ukraine? Thank you, Irina. Uh, let, let me sh uh, insert a small disclaimer. Uh, I, I will not be speaking uh, from the whole business or uh, unfortunately, I don't have enough empirical evidence. I mean, some statistics or analytics. I will mostly uh, say from my feelings and like uh, an expert understanding. So the first point is that what, what I see that uh, in the very beginning, uh, it was uh, a two-way uh, activity. Uh, some shareholders, uh, some man top managers uh, uh, were pushing and uh, forcing their companies to, to support uh, the uh, military forces, uh, to support volunteers and so on. But I, I do know also some, some more interesting examples uh, as, as for me, uh, when it was a bottom-up direction, like uh, the mid-management uh, of different companies uh, owned by, let's say, uh, oligarchs, or I would say, or even multinationals, which uh, at the very first months or at the very first weeks were not aware of, uh, of their managers acting and uh, spending resources of the com of, of their companies and uh, and saving lives and saving uh, sim simply saving country uh, and as it appeared like uh, after the three days uh, these three days uh, <laughs> when they passed so it appeared to be a good uh, and the proper way and uh, afterwards though that companies uh, they uh, uh, made it an official policy. So the the first the very first message here and, and my my conclusion is that uh, we are lucky to have Ukrainian citizens, which uh, uh, were like on uh, on positions in business, and which transformed during this uh, period transform, transformed some corporate com some corporations into corporate citizens. Uh, though. Some of them were not acting like corporate citizens, but the war showed them as they were acting as, as, as them. Uh, of course, the war uh, had a lot of disruptions, starting from supply chain, electricity, uh, capacity in terms of employee, simply employees, uh, and security of employees, ending up uh, breaking like logistics channels and sales. So uh, uh, the the shortest uh, and the simplest uh, and the lightest issue for a business was simply you you get it uh, done uh, a very uh, in in a more difficult in the end in a more long way. So a normal uh, route to to buy something or to sell something from a couple of days it just stretched to several weeks or even months. Let's say when you speak about uh, agricultural business, it's it takes uh, like several months to sell, comparing to literally to to some days before the war. And uh, on the opposite, the supply chain also was has been disrupted. Uh, luckily, sometimes because of volunteers, but again the uh, the bottleneck of of the border didn't allow a lot of uh, inputs to come uh, uh, to into business. So uh, a lot of companies uh, had to uh, redraft their routes and or or at least to to look for some, some other ways. So this has created a, a lot of opportunities for Ukrainian companies to become more resilient and to uh, 
and to become uh, uh, and to make the, the whole country more resilient uh, and they hope that it will uh, uh, stick after the after the victory and it will uh, it will not be forgotten and uh, the risk management the supply chain risk, supply chain risk management the different policies in terms of uh, diversification different policies uh, in terms of uh, disaster recovery and business continuity planning uh, they will be treated uh, not just as a, a fancy story brought from Western uh, parts of the world, but uh, they will be treated as it is now treated, as a tool for survival. And, uh, and it will be uh, treated as a, afterwards as a tool for uh, competency and, uh, and competition. Uh, so that's in general, uh, that's, that's all from my side. Uh, I, I hope maybe someone can add in terms of business. Thank you, Oleg. And uh, maybe I also ask Roman uh, to add something from the uh, part and side of business. Uh, and, and the same question, like very general one, would business become a resource for our national resilience for future Ukraine? Uh, it, thank you for your question. It can and should, but we have already had at least one big missed opportunity. I would say that the initial weeks of the war, uh, of the full-scale war, uh, occasioned a kind of uh, opening opening of the accounts, a kind of everyone putting what they had on the table in order to help the cause. Uh, businesses voluntarily paying taxes ahead of time. Companies, uh, you know, generously buying all sorts of stuff, whether management at the very top knew or not. Uh, and that, to me, was potentially uh, the kind of moral basis for a reboot of the relationship between business and the controlling organs of the state. Uh, however, when the state tax system and custom system came back into operation in June, July of 22, many of their old habits came back with them. And so this kind of us and them, as opposed to we're all in this together attitude, uh, has been returning. And that is the missed opportunity that I, that I see. Uh, we have in particular been looking at what's been happening in terms of the treatment of uh, companies, mostly small and medium, uh, in terms of value added tax, where nearly half the active taxpayers in Ukraine have been shifted into a riskier or more audit environment, which to me seems to run counter to the way you would want to build a collaborative uh, sort of uh, relationship of solidarity between uh, business and and the state. Uh, let me also then flag another problem. Uh, I don't want to be only the problem guy because we're also solutions people, but uh, and that is a kind of literalist approach to the law. That means that best efforts by people, whether it's in the wartime situation or other economic situations, are not validated. And instead, uh, those who uh, attempted to implement laws uh, in a way that ultimately benefited both the state and society end up being accused and prosecuted. I think if you've seen today's conviction of the former manager of Caves Borispil Airport for the crime of actually successfully leasing space to uh, companies 
and increasing the uh, revenues of the airport because there, there were procedural issues with the state property fund in terms of how this was done, then you can see that the state is actually sending out, again, contradictory signals. It is saying, come, join rebuilding, let us all be happy together, but we will inspect you to within an inch of your lives, or a centimeter, it being a, a metric country. Uh, and if there is some formality in the way, we're going to come after you seven years later, if necessary. Uh, so I think these are not the signals that should be being sent. Uh, there is, I think, a need to build on the goodwill of ordinary citizens and of the great majority of the business community. Uh, and that that is where government should be uh, putting its energies and putting its emphasis. Because indeed, uh, Ukrainian business is a source of resilience. Uh, the vast majority of Ukrainian business people want to do the right thing. But uh, being caught up in various formalist definitions that then allow you, to, that allow traps to be sprung on you, that's not the way to build uh, the collaborative relationship of the future. Thank you. Thank you, Roman, for uh, also reminding us that uh, this uh, that this is the road with uh, both sides uh, drive. Yeah. So it's it's if, not just I, business here. If I may, I, I would also like to add about one one more example of a missed opportunity. Maybe it's not still missed, but. Uh, uh, a, a lesson about uh, how we should treat uh, the strategic businesses uh, and, and, and how we should uh, uh, allocate uh, resources across the country. Uh, a simple example of when they were erupted, uh, some of the businesses uh, uh, did stop operations despite uh, understanding that they influence their influence on communities and other sectors or businesses were way too much and way too important. Simply one small plant in Dnipro, in Dnipro city could uh, impact like the whole sector, uh, which is which is supply and raw materials to that plant. And, uh, and a, a thousand of people uh, without a job, uh, without uh, any material uh, and, uh, uh, of uh, material without any money just to survive uh, during this uh, during this period. So uh, from one from one hand, uh, you have to to take care about your people. So it's it's good to that you take care about people and you close your plant and then uh, uh, you just wait for a better times. From the from the other hand, uh, is it good like when if again no shelters. No, no, no shellings are coming. Uh, some of the businesses still uh, continued their operations and they it, it was vital to, to, uh, to continue and to process certain agricultural foods, for example, or to process certain industrial materials and bring that uh, uh, currency, bring that exports to, uh, to Ukraine and, uh, and, and make the economy at least rock at, at some moment. Uh, and uh, uh, from the other hand, uh, there's also a, a missed lesson. Uh, we had the war erupted in 2014, and still, uh, till 2022, uh, a lot of big businesses were dependent on Russian suppliers or even Russian clients. And of course, when this uh, full uh, full scale uh, war erupted, it just it uh, it all affected. Yeah, thank you, thank you for bringing this and mentioning this too. Uh, so now, Professor Angeli, for many years you have been studying and teaching responsibility of the business in local and global context. Uh, as the result of your deep research, you have developed a framework, from what I know, that integrates the ideas of wealth creation and human rights. 
can you please describe it briefly and apparently how it can be useful for Ukrainian business to develop responsibility for the future of our country? Yes, well, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me and having the honor and the pleasure to participate in this interesting, very interesting uh, and eye-opening uh, conversation. Uh, you know, I'm, uh, not, I have not been in Ukraine so far, uh, but I would like to come to see you and to learn more about what you're doing. But uh, the experiences which we just heard from Oleg and Roman, I think are extremely important. What I'm trying to do is uh, to propose a kind of framework uh, to put those uh, challenges and also opportunities for business uh, in uh, Ukraine into a broader context. And I have developed that over many years. I was uh, first very active in Western Europe, uh, but then in the United States and since the 1990s also taught and did research in China, a very different environment. So, what I, my short uh, presentation is basically about, uh, uh, well, responsible business. For, what does it mean for wealth creation and human rights? So uh, what is responsible business? Uh, this is a fundamental question in business ethics and uh, would need a long and differentiated answer. I cannot provide it in the short time of our panel discussion now. Uh, rather, I want to briefly present some important points I extensively developed in my recent book, Corporate Responsibility for U Wealth Creation and Human Rights. Responsible business includes the people and organizations who are involved in business activities to the extent they have some spaces of freedom to make decisions and action actions. The bigger their spaces of freedom are, the bigger their ethical or moral responsibility is. Drawing on the German philosopher Walter Schulz, responsibility is defined as follows, as self-commitment originating from freedom in worldly relationships. This involves two poles of human action, namely the interior commitment of the actors to act responsibly, a commitment, and their engagement in very concrete relationships with other actors, persons, organizations, communities, non-human beings, and uh, nature. So responsibility is a relational concept with three components. Who is responsible, the subject, for what one is responsible, to the content, and towards whom one is responsible. I think to distinguish these three components helps to better understand the often complex issues of responsible business. The subjects of responsibility are individuals, per individual persons from the top business leader to middle managers, group leaders, individual employees. To the extent of their corresponding spaces of freedom as mentioned before. In addition, subjects of responsibility are also business organizations in so far as they constitute small actors. They form collective entities that are distinct, but not separate from individual members, have certain spaces of freedom, acting with intention or at least exhibiting intentional behavior to achieve their goals and impacting people and nature. I think this understanding of corporations as small actors has developed only since the 1980s. And it's important to assess the ethical responsibility of individuals, of organization, businesses, and of economies. Now, regarding the addressees to whom the subjects are responsible, the widely accepted stakeholder approach refers to different so-called stakeholders or individuals and group who have a stake in the business organization, namely employees, shareholders, customers, suppliers, communities, Moreover, beyond these stakeholders, one should mention society at large and, of course, nature. So more difficult is, to, is it to determine what is the content of responsible business. And my short answer is, as I mentioned before, I would say it's for creating wealth in a comprehensive sense and respecting human rights. 
This will help us to perceive and understand important resources for national resilience. Now, to conceive wealth creation in a comprehensive sense, we begin with the question, what makes a country like Ukraine rich? And uh, we remember Adam Smith's book uh, on the wealth of nations, very old, 1776, who asked what makes countries rich? Well, the common answer to that question is a lot of money or a huge amount of economic and financial assets a high GDP or gross domestic product. However, uh, these indicators are misleading, I think, and cannot measure our lives. I very much influenced by uh, Amatia Zen and Joseph Stiglitz, who published that book, uh, Mismanagement, uh, Mismeasuring Our Lives, What GDP Doesn't Add Up. So the question is, well, what is really important? How, what are the components of wealth in a comprehensive sense? And there are seven uh, features uh, about four types of uh, capital, not only economic capital, but also natural, human, and social capital. Uh, wealth of a nation is a combination of private and public wealth. Uh, the distributive and the, dis uh, and the producing dimension are closely interconnected. Uh, wealth in uh, creation involves not only a material, but also a spiritual aspect. Sustainable development should be understood in terms of human capabilities, uh, like Amartya Sen does. Creating means make something new and better. And finally, uh, wealth creation needs self-regarding and other-regarding motivations. You can see that this understanding uh, goes far beyond the market institution. Markets are important. And I learned that already, uh, many years ago, again, in China, how China, the Chinese reform was really uh, driven by market behavior. But markets are limited. And uh, I think uh, if we only set on markets with a self-regarding motivation and focus on material aspects, we miss the point. That's why we need other regarding motivations for collective actions. So all those seven features, I think, are indispensable for natural resilience in, U in Ukraine. And uh, so I can only point to a few examples which might uh, supplement what we heard before. <clears throat> for instance, regarding the four types of capital, the war has destroyed enormous amounts of economic capital that is physical and financial capital, but also natural capital, that is natural resource stocks, land, ecosystems. Hundreds of thousands of people were killed, many more wounded and affected by disease. That means human capital, namely educated and healthy people. Social capital as trust relations among individuals has probably increased in so far as the pressure of war has united Ukrainian people but also suffered from hopelessness and this, this despair. I uh, um, was interested uh, in what Roman said that, uh, uh, about the missed uh, opportunity, uh, that at the beginning of the war, there was a lot of uh, other regarding uh, motivations. And uh, I think uh, afterwards they turned around or to the old, older pattern of, uh, of motivations. So you see, uh, motivations in business are very important. A few more examples regarding private and public wealth. Not only vast amounts of private wealth, but also immense amounts of public wealth uh, have been destroyed, like infrastructure of transportation and, um, and communication, uh, public buildings, etc. And they will need comprehensive reconstruction. Regarding the creation understood as innovation, um, the war has rendered many pre-war modes of production impossible, supply chain, etc., and requires new ways of manufacturing and entrepreneurship during and after the war. Or looking at the balance of self and other regarding motivations, as I said, the war has brought forth many, much selfless, selflessness bravery and fortitude in the fight for freedom and sovereignty of Ukraine. And these re other regarding motivations, I think, will be also very crucial for creating wealth 
after the war. So that, these are a couple of thoughts about wealth creation. Uh, closely uh, to this uh, notion uh, is the protection, respect, and the remedy of human rights. Uh, this strong focus on human rights in business was anonymously enforced by the United Nations Council on Human Rights in 2008 and 2011, and further enhanced by national and regional treatises. At stake are all internationally recognized human rights, which include not only civil and political, but also economic, social, and cultural rights, and the right to development. While states have the duty to protect and remedy human rights, all business enterprises have the responsibility, that's the term which is used in, that, uh, in the United Nations uh, principles, uh, guiding principles, the responsibility of business to respect human rights, which is independent of states. And along with states, the businesses have to remedy human rights. These are the three pillars which John Raggi developed uh, in the late nine, uh, 2000 and came out with the guiding principles in 2011. So businesses have to consider human rights in due diligence processes as they already have to exert due diligence regarding, the, for instance, the quality of product components in their supply chains. So in my view, human rights constitute global public goods characterized by non-excludability and non-rivalry, as economists uh, say. Their fulfillment cannot be achieved by market institutions and processes. Rather, it requires collective actions and other regarding motivations. It's, I think, a very important uh, point. Moreover, human rights constitute the spirit, uh, spiritual aspect of wealth creation at the macro level. And the illustrative example, I think, is the Treaty on Europe on European Union, uh, which was consolidated over many years, and uh, that establishes the principle of liberty, democracy, respect for human rights, and fundamental freedoms and the rule of law. Article two highlights the fundamental values. So the union, it, I quote, the union is founded on the values of respect for human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law, and respect for human rights, including the rights of persons belonging to minorities. These values are common to the member states in a society in which pluralism, non-discrimination, tolerance, justice, solidarity, and the equality between women and men prevail. End quote. Because Ukraine str strives to join the European Union, I think it's crucial for national resilience to embrace these fundamental values. This holds for all levels of action at the systemic level of the country, the region, and the whole world, at the organizational level of business enterprises, and civil society organizations and other entities, and at the individual level of persons in all spheres of life including the business sector. So in our panel on business, responsible business, uh, the resource of national resilience, we are exploring and searching for answers to those critical questions. My short answer is, as this framework illustrates, that business is responsible for wealth creation and human rights. I hope this gives us valuable guidance in our search. But it also leaves many questions open, for sure. How can we better understand and solve them? Mm. Well, we are fortunate that the team of professors and, and students at the Ukrainian Catholic University has formed to investigate business ethics challenges and opportunities in the country of Ukraine. They participate in the global survey of business ethics 2022-2024, under the leadership of uh, Yarina Boychuk. Uh, this survey uses questionnaire and interview schedule and produce a country report in the course of this year. I'm sure this investigation will provide us with a solid foundation 
for the training of business ethics in business enterprises operating in Ukraine and for the teaching and research in the UQ Business School. It is a very valuable and timely project that deserves our full report, full support. Thank you very much for your attention. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I could not say much about Ukraine, the concrete situation, but I wanted to outline this framework, which I think helps us a little bit to structure our discussion. Thank you. Thank you, George. Thank you for your help and support of our uh, project in cooperation. So I hope it will be just a fir the first uh, step or a first step. Uh, thank you. And, um, you know, for me, when we talk about human rights and community development and what impact can business have on them, I always think what faith uh, and church has for us, if any. And I will ask Andri Kostyuk, uh, whose experience I find exceptional, working in corporate law and being faculty of uh, Catholic social teaching at UQ. Uh, Andri, what business can learn from church, if any? Are there any useful cases also to learn for business? Thank you. Thank you, Irena. Do you hear me well? Yes. Yeah, basically now. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Yes, we do. So I just want to talk a bit on uh, different challenges which uh, we have now in Ukraine and where church input and also our Catholic University input can be of tremendous importance. Uh, frankly, we still do not see till the end. Uh, what depths of uh, economic and social crisis uh, will Ukraine come into till the end of the war. Recently, I was on the conference where people were discussing the impact which uh, Ukrainian war has in Europe. For example, there is about 6 to 8% inflation in different kinds of European Union. And uh, people on the conference discussed that, yeah, it's, uh, it's a big challenge. Uh, poor people get less, uh, prices go up. Uh, nobody wants to increase the salary because it's incentive to get the inflation even higher. It's a factor. Then I st stood up and asked, uh, look, in Ukraine, uh, inflation last year was about 30%. People did not get much uh, salaries increase. Basically, 25% of Ukrainians are now officially unemployed. Nobody is protesting. Why? What's, what's your reason? Why Ukrainian people are not protesting against the situation? So there was like three minute silence. The answer is rather simple people have uh, much more difficult problems to think about. Yeah, because they are afraid of whatever airstrikes, they are afraid uh, that uh, Russians will come here and that Ukrainian state will be destroyed in general. So all these fears basically silence the everyday problems uh, which are very deep and which these people face. Nobody knows, but uh, 5 million people were uh, abroad now refugees, more than 5 million people. Will they come back? Uh, only 30% of them will come back. How many people will live after the war in Ukraine? I don't know, perhaps 25 million, uh, in good case scenario, etc. out of 38, which was before the war. So all these issues will come, of course, to another serious challenge resilience challenge uh, even in case of our victory because normally after war we have uh, in history cases of social turbulences this was after the first world war this was after the second world war it was uh, all the days in the middle ages etc we have uh, reasons to believe that uh, challenges for ukrainian society will be in the future and here comes the experience which uh, Catholic Church in general, which Greek Catholic Church in particular did have uh, in the former 
times and how they met these challenges. For example, uh, Ukrainian society was in deep crisis after the first world war here in the western part of uh, Ukraine. Perhaps not so deep as in the eastern part, but here Ukrainians were suffering because they were a nation which was defeated in the so-called Ukrainian-Polish war of uh, 1918-1919. So basically Ukrainians felt they are occupied by Polish state. Polish state uh, thought Ukrainians are bad citizens, so they should be discriminated to a certain extent until they behave properly. Uh, church in these difficult economic conditions managed to do, in a certain sense, really miraculous things. For example, a cooperative movement of uh, Galician peasants, which was inspired by Metropolitan Andrei Shetitsky of the uh, Greek Catholic Church, and which was led to some inter priests by other intelligentsia members which were related with the church, they managed to create uh, almost uh, half monopolists of uh, export, for example, of milk products out of Poland, which had up to 50% of the market, in spite of the fact that Ukrainian peasants were just 16% of uh, rural population uh, of that day's Poland. So they were basically three times more efficient than their Polish competitors due to this organization. Other examples we can give from uh, other countries, again, in the mid time between two wars, uh, there were so-called corporations, organizations were working class and entrepreneurs were sitting together on the same table trying to solve their issues at the times when uh, in other countries or on other branches they were having difficult clashes of whatever strikes lockouts and uh, social unrest now we talk about stakeholders as something uh, new it's not so new it's basically from that period that idea that businesses, if they want to be of the social impact and if they want to be stable, have to recognize the social responsibility. Otherwise, there will be revolution, there will be social unrest. So today we understand that not only shareholders, but also employees and the civil society and the state, they are all interested in prosperous and uh, good business. And this is partially because of what impact uh, social teaching of the church of the 30s, 40s, and after the Second World War, including the elaboration of theories of human rights and uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, Christians, and especially Catholic intellectuals were among those who inspired and worked on the documents, including United Nations Declaration. Mm -hmm. To come back to Ukrainian issues, uh, since the very start of this war, church and our university were actively engaged in uh, volunteers movement, basically millions of uh, dollars of humanitarian help, which came from abroad was processed and uh, distributed by uh, our volunteers. And this is just the very beginning. The most important task, in my opinion, during the next years will be to work on what uh, some people uh, call new social contract in Ukraine. Because we are still a country which needs a lot of reform and not only legal reform, we need uh, internal conversion to new types of relations. We were talking about justice, about rule of law, about real respect uh, of other people. And this is what is lacking, not just by uh, some officials or not just by some institutions, but uh, society itself after this uh, post-communist trauma still needs a lot of uh, change in the internal 
understanding of different people, of those who are business people and of those who are the employees, of those who serve for the state and of those who defend, uh, like lawyers who defend uh, business against uh, some uh, invasive or corrupt measures which state allow itself still even during the time of war, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So really, I think uh, university, uh, our university and the church in general can play a tremendous role in discussing those issues, putting them uh, into friendly context rather than in accusing each other and whatever trying to combat each other. We really have to find uh, new understanding and new consensus in general so that this country can be really prosperous and can fit for being a member of the European Union. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Andrei. That's uh, exactly what we are doing here. And as you mentioned, this is just the start. Yeah, thank you. And now I have a question uh, in this context, uh, context to, uh, to uh, Roman Vashchuk. So what is and what should be the role of the state to coordinate economic activities? Um, it's about to, to regulate them as little as necessary, like, you know, business likes, and to give them freedom as much as possible and to keep them responsible. <laughs> Unmute. Unmute, right there it is, okay. Uh, that would be in an ideal world, yes. Uh, I think, though, what is required is something that affects more than just the state. And that is, of course, where uh, Ukrainian Catholic University and business schools and others can make contribution. It requires a thoroughgoing, almost pan-societal change in approach because you cannot effectively deregulate in a state where everyone assumes that giving an inch, everyone will take a mile. Uh, in other words, you need the recreation of trust is required to be able to release the, bond, the bonds of the state. And there's a need uh, as well for a discretion to be seen as a part of the decision-making process and not as an immediate potential for abuse. Because again, over-regulation in Ukraine stems from the desire to prevent abuse by writing down every possible option. The more you do that, the more it comes into conflict with other detailed regulations. And then of course, the wrong kind of discretion has to be used to deconflict or get around uh, the collisions that you have engineered through your lack of trust in business or your lack of trust in fellow uh, Ukrainians. Uh, so that uh, that is something that has to accompany, uh, let's say, uh, regulatory guillotine or uh, or deregulation. And similarly, uh, you need to decriminalize initiative because again, uh, the court cases we're seeing are all of for people of people who took on responsibilities made decisions. Those decisions, everyone agrees, were generally economically and societally positive, but there may have been formal clashes of one level of regulation or another. And instead of saying, well, that is what happens in a change process, uh, the, these things need to be resolved, etc. You say, no, let's take the opportunity to uh, prosecute these people uh, thus sending the signal that you shouldn't take the risk of acting for the public good, leaving the private sector, coming into the public sector, and taking a 
non-bureaucratic decision-making style into that uh, uh, into that sector. Uh, so, so I think the problem is actually more attitudinal, and it requires modeling behavior from the top uh, of of ministries. It requires a, a you know. It requires some courts to act the way the uh, higher anti-corruption court did when it saw the accusations against uh, the allegations against Kovalev. They said, you know, we don't see there's any reason to lock him up because we don't see that there's actually grounds for the case. Uh, that is a positive signal. That is a signal of the system of a system exercising discretion as it should. Uh, so it, it it requires this more broadly based uh, realignment of, uh, of incentives and attitudes, which is far more difficult than simply changing one law for another. Yeah, I can imagine. So now we are back to new social contract needed. And, That's it. Uh, yes, and the rule of law and the trust as a consequence of uh, this. Yes, I see that Oleg wants to add something. Yeah, uh, thank, you. Uh, thank you. I'm afraid that we are referring to state as a regulator or potential player imposing a new social contract. I'm afraid uh, the state will not be able to do it because of lack of trust. And I'm just checked uh, as uh, Andre was speaking uh, about the church uh, and the, the case with uh, Andrei Shuptitsky, I, I just checked the uh, recent uh, survey of trust to Ukrainian institutions. Of course, the lowest levels are to uh, prosecutors, uh, uh, legal uh, uh, jurisdictions, and so on, and government as well. And then, unfortunately, the trust to, to church is also declining and is on the same level as to government. So when we speak about uh, someone imposing uh, something like a potential uh, con uh, social contract, this can be someone with a high level of trust. Right now, it's uh, military forces, president, and volunteers. And that's, I'm afraid, uh, can be a, a, like an issue. <laughs> uh, and, and, and on the other hand, uh, Referring back to uh, to, Rom to Roman's uh, presentation uh, and and to George's, uh, we forget about uh, as an institution, a potential institution of uh, imposing such trust as a corporate citizens. And in Ukraine, unfortunately, corporations are not treated as citizens right now. For example. We've been fighting as a unique for uh, uh, integrity network for imposing a corporate liability, making sure that the corporations can act like a, a person in a, a separate person in legal proceedings, and on the other hand, uh, have a, corp a, a liability, uh, which could also affect good corporate citizens uh, in Ukraine as well, and be and and, pro and give good examples, and. Uh, uh, and again, when we speak about corporate citizens, uh, uh, Georges, uh, I, I have questions uh, to, to your framework, uh, if, I, if I may, Irina. Yeah? Yeah, that's great. Uh, yeah, because uh, I, I do like uh, the, uh, I, I would say it's quite wide uh, view on, on the corporate responsibility and uh, it's it's far, uh, it goes far beyond which we've seen uh, historically. However, uh, it, it's I, I'm afraid uh, it's uh, it will not be treated uh, uh, by pragmatic businesses. Like let let me ex explain. Like uh, we still see examples how companies uh, ex exploited Ukrainian, for example, Ukrainian tax regime, and simply paying less taxes. And hiring more people here, and uh, paying less taxes is not sustainable for a society, in, and it's is definitely is not about creating a new wealth here, uh, and uh, uh, that's that can be an issue. Or like selling some harmful uh, drugs or harmful uh, 
uh, chemicals to business here, which have been already banned by the European Union or other countries. And which is, and this is also like, of course we can say it's not responsible, but we can still see such examples. Or simply when we speak about digging uh, the raw materials, and again, we, we understand that current tax regime uh, is done that way that it's not sustainable. It's so low comparing to other EU countries that it's uh, when when you simply dig iron ore, it's uh, it, it's not about creating wealth for Ukraine and for Ukrainian citizens, or or, or simply when you when some corporation exploitate the uh, ecology laws, uh, which are not uh, so good comparing to other countries. So do I understand correctly that if a company follows such practices, it is not responsible? Uh, thank you very much, because also I want to add to it the questions I had, and it's very interconnected with what you asked. It's, uh, is there any contribution of trans uh, international corporations in Ukraine uh, to responsibility? I mean, should they be responsible here in Ukraine, and what should be their contribute to national resilience in future? Yeah, George, so the question was to your model, too. Well, thank you. These are very important uh, questions and critical questions. Uh, you know, I try to very briefly explain the term responsibility based on that uh, uh, important work of that philosopher in Tübingen, and uh, Walter Schulz. And he says uh, the distinction between uh, the ethics of responsibility and the ethics of uh, good intentions is not acceptable. You know, that means. Uh, responsibility has those two poles, has an inner commitment on the one hand and a behavior in concrete relationships with others, both. And that means uh, corporations cannot just uh, behave uh, externally or for a good reputation to do something, but they need a commitment. And that I think is something new uh, in our discussion about corporate responsibility. Uh, and it was fortunate that uh, John Raggi and uh, the, the, the UN Glo Global Compact and then John Raggi who developed those UN guiding principles was focusing how to give very specific criteria uh, of uh, responsibility of companies in the supply chain, etc. And I think these are criteria which are now highly uh, dis discussed. For instance, the EU, is, is setting up a, a law of uh, due diligence, human rights due diligence in the supply chain, which means that companies, companies are responsible for uh, uh, re human rights violations if they have a direct uh, business relationship with those people or indirect, etc. But I think you are right, you know, that is, we are at the beginning of a process, hopefully, which will. Uh, be much uh, stronger in the future. But uh, I just uh, wanted, uh, I think uh, also uh, Andre mentioned uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, when uh, Catholic uh, uh, scholars were very involved in that, and many others, Chinese and Indians, etc. And uh, But at that time, we talked about the responsibility of states who are responsible to protect, uh, to respect uh, human rights. But we did not talk about the responsibility of corporations. That is new, you know, and, uh, and I think that is necessary to understand uh, for business ethics, but also for the role or the, the relationship between what is the role of the law on the one hand and uh, ethical considerations and commitment on the other side. Uh, so we both uh, belong together. Um, I wanted to, and of course, you know, trust, uh, the lack of trust, uh, which Oleg mentioned, uh, a huge uh, amount of uh, lack of trust uh, in companies, in government, etc. Uh, in my terminology, that is, it's a lack of social capital. You know, social capital means trust relations between actors. And that has been uh, in the discussion uh, on in uh, sociology and in uh, management and 
and philosophy an important issue in the last 30 years. It is possible to operationalize social trust and to, but uh, it is extremely important. Without that, you cannot build a flourishing economy. It's impossible. So there are lots of challenges, but uh, um, I think uh, uh, no. also, you know, the, I'm focusing on the uh, on the goods uh, of or cap, cap, capital as flock as stocks and flows or goods private and public, and I think uh, and not so much uh, what can the state do and what can private the private sector do because the state also should produce not only public goods, but also is producing many private goods. And on the other hand, I would say companies, the private sector has a responsibility to help uh, uh, produce public wealth, uh, because uh, without public wealth, without uh, transportation infrastructure and other things, they cannot do their business. It is an interdependence of both. And uh, so, uh, so a few remarks, but uh, I don't want to, um, you know, I, these are suggestions of thoughts, a framework which needs to be filled with concrete experiences and explain, uh, examples uh, in your own uh, uh, country. Thank you. Thank you, George. And uh, I think it's a at least for me, it's very interesting to, to have or to hear the answer from uh, Roman Vaschuk. Uh, so what can and should international business contribute to national resilience in future in Ukraine? Uh, Ukraine is counting on a significant influx of foreign investment in the post-war, post-victory period. Although I have to flag here that uh, for that, Ukrainian business has to be happy. You cannot simply make international business happy while your own business community is feeling put upon. So that is important. You, 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 uh, this idea of the invest nannies that will make life magically perfect for foreigners while uh, actual Ukrainian businesses suffer through ordinary treatment it, in the long term, it's not going to work. Uh, international business can bring, obviously, strong corporate cultures, uh, strong, uh, in some cases, strong ethical uh, frameworks uh, that have stood the test across a range of operating environments, uh, which can then help benefit the Ukrainian business environment. One thing, of course, you have to be careful of is that, in fact, uh, having deep pockets and resources, international companies do not contribute to the controversial, problematic aspects of re Reconstruction. Uh, I think they also need to share their experience with the local companies. Uh, so, in other words, the, uh, the backbone that made them successful internationally should be extended uh, to the network of local suppliers as they undertake large projects uh, in a post-victory uh, Ukraine. And then, and then uh, where they have best practices, those best practices will be adopted by suppliers and therefore create a sort of virtuous loop of uh, extending uh, good corporate citizenship into the country uh, as a whole. Uh, you know, I, 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 there will be the problem, and there already is the problem, of companies that have maintained a strong operational presence in Russia, which undercuts all of their claims to, uh, you know, uh, whether it's ESG, DEI, all these uh, buzzwords, uh, corporately, Ukrainians, will not be buying moralizing from these com from these companies. So the companies will in part be uh, those who have acted swiftly and decisively vis-a-vis -vis Russia will have uh, an advantage in a post-victory Ukraine. Uh, and they need to use that advantage responsibly.
Thank you. Uh, I just want to remind uh, our guests who are here with us uh, that you have an opportunity to have your question. Uh, you can write it in our uh, Zoom chat uh or maybe to announce aloud we still have yes okay uh, uh, could, could i just uh, add something while the guests are figuring out their questions oh yes, uh, yes. A, a, another an, an important role i think for uh again business schools connected and ethicists working with them is also to provide uh economic education to the authorities. I mean, Ukraine is supposed to have a new economic a Bureau of Economic Security. Uh, it, uh, it looks like it's going to be rebooted. Uh, in fact, while we've been having this session tonight, uh, you know, I had mentioned that the uh, higher anti-corruption court had very sensibly ruled in the Kobolev case, while well, their appeals level just uh, reverse that, putting him on, on bail of 230 million hryvnia. Uh, so uh, what I can see is that the anti-corruption agencies, this whole wonderful new network is to some extent, large extent, economically and corporately ignorant. They need engagement from people like yourselves to tell them about the way the international business world works and about corporate practices, uh, the self-regulating self aspects of them, but also what is normal business procedures and what is corruption? Because they appear to, uh, beyond certain formal uh, aspects of Ukrainian law, to be largely clueless when it comes to assessing economic behavior. And that is now leading to very unfortunate consequences. Hmm. Yeah, thank if you. I Maybe still can I'm... add something. Yeah. Yes, yes. To I, the, I just to wanted to ask issue. you to add something. Yes, exactly. Yeah, thank you, Yarena. I'm sure. Uh, yeah, I completely agree with what uh, was just said. Uh, the problem with uh, all this anti corruption agency is that they still work in the same social niveau and what uh, they think is their main goal. To bring as more as possible uh, high officials to what they think is justice. Namely, if something was wrong in Boris Pil, with Minister Pavarsky, with the seaport, with Kobolev of Nafto Gas, those people who were taking this uh, not easy decisions in 2014-17, let's do it for just in case. You know, this problem that we are still very accusing ready society and we enjoy it you know the people are basically enjoying that if Kobali got whatever several hundred million bonus for whatever reason even if the state got because of him 2.3 billion dollars it's still nice if he suffers you know people like that uh, whatever business people rich managers whatever high state officials suffer and this uh, this is a bad consensus this consensus uh, is very often used by different types of tyrants because what tyrants are doing tyrants are giving to crowd another victim and crowd uh, is happy eating this victim and then tyrant can do whatever he wants until the crowd is unhappy and needs another victim so if we step on this way this uh, the country which will be poor and uh, full of weapons and full of psychologically crooked people after the war will not attract uh, any investors and uh, will be not attractive also for its own citizens to, to stay in it. So I can just repeat once more, we have to talk seriously about these issues and talk uh, not with the view to accuse somebody, but really to change the general social attitude, starting from ourselves, to many issues, because otherwise this, be, this country will be unhappy forever. 
Yeah. And this is where I see the role of university and, and the church can be tremendous. And those part of Ukrainian business, really not international corporations, they are really unhappy to be here sometimes because they don't know what to do with their local branches. They are unhappy to go out of Russia because they earn money there, but they are not happy to be in Ukraine because there are so many troubles here. So the, this is really the Ukrainian business, first of all, which has to take the social responsibility. In the nearest months and, and years, not, uh, not when, whatever, in 20 years. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Andrei. I see the hand from Sofia Batska. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's really, uh, I would say, deep and deep discussion. Um, um, well, I have uh, kind of, um, how should I, how should I put it? I have kind of uh, dissonance uh, with the. Um, with the statement regarding uh, international companies um, um, as a benchmark for, for many Ukrainian businesses at the moment. Um, we know that only 185 companies left Russian market and um, um, over this last year. And um, it was obviously very difficult, very painful in money decision for those 185 companies, but still they did this and others did not and um, there was recently there was an article in danish newspaper where um, one of the biggest companies rockwool uh, which does insulation um, uh, is, is telling that the red line for them is when uh, russia will use nuclear power uh, so it's not even about uh, it's not it, it has nothing to do with human rights it has nothing to do with uh, um, whatever our country is going through, it 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 has as a red line already uh, using of nuclear nuclear missiles and nuclear power uh, against another country. Um, so I'm a little bit confused. You know uh, how can and, and people are still buying from Rockwell. Uh, people are buying from Rockwell in very many countries, not only in Russia. And while the Ukrainians were kind of scared to face very cold winter, you know, Russians, they were protected by Rockwell. Uh, I can give many other examples, but this was for me like uh, really mind blowing in a way that, uh, so if the red lines are so far from, from uh, basic things, you know, basic things we are fighting for, uh, how can those companies um, be an example for, for people? Um, how can they be an example for other companies in, in many countries? Um, so I don't know. Uh, I, I obviously do not put the question, but I'm trying to add something to this discussion that um, sometimes it looks for us uh, really black and white, but somehow other people are not taking it black and white or their black is much, much more black than, than our black is. And then that's the question, then how do we go to the business school? Because obviously people in Rockwell, probably they have finished one of the best business schools in the world and they have been taught many smart and beautiful things. And uh, um, they probably learned a lot about responsibility and took some course in corporate social responsibility. So obviously we are not doing uh, on the global scale um, some good job with that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Sophia. Does someone want to comment or I can have the connected question to it? Uh, okay, it was rhetoric <laughs> question or comment. Uh, so I would like to use this moment that uh, I'm the director I of think, the business yes, I think George, I'm sorry. I think George wanted uh, to respond. I, don't, <laughs> and I think he should be the I one don't to see respond. It. I don't see. I'm sorry. Sorry. Thank you, Sophia. Sure. Thank you. Well, I think this is a, it's a cr very crucial uh, issue. But uh, when uh, we try to, well, to be taught uh, business ethics at Notre Dame and also in China, I always uh, said it's much more important to study good examples, good corporations than uh, uh, bad corporations. Of course, we need some bad examples. And uh, in my book, I quote uh, Volkswagen Germany and uh, also Wells Fargo and others. 
but they are good examples. And uh, for instance, for me, Medtronic, uh, who produced uh, produces medical devices, uh, has done a great job for the health of people around the world uh, with some problems also, yes. But my point is for teaching, uh, it is really important to, to have a strong focus on good examples to invite those managers to the business school and, and uh, also to ask uh, students uh, to critically analyze those case studies and to see what is possible, what is feasible, but uh, we should not, uh, I think, uh, just uh, uh, make the mistakes that everything is black or white. Yeah, indeed. Uh, yes, Roman? Uh, I, 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 I think I tried in, in my contribution to, to point out that there is this contradiction and that Ukrainians are not going to be in a mood to, to take any moralizing from companies that continue to operate in Russia. Uh, but I think more broadly, uh, Westerners dealing with Ukraine will need to accept that a post-conflict Ukraine will not want to be lectured at or moralized at by anybody who has not gone through what the country has gone through. And if you, we have to accept that from, especially from 2014, there is a whole industry that has developed of coming in and lecturing at Ukrainians and telling them how to become better people if they only pick up the right buzzwords. People are not going to take it. And this is what I tell my EBRD friends and others. You've got to change your mindset too. I mean, no more missionary, no more uh, moralizing. It's going to get thrown back in your faces. Yeah, thank you. So I just want to use maybe as a conclusion, I want to, to use this five minutes left and uh, um, maybe to hear some suggestions or some uh, like directions for you. What uh, can and should Uku Business School teach business in order to be responsible, in order to create wealth? in our country and in order to uh, recover Ukraine and build our country of our dream. Uh, this is the question to each of you, dear speakers. I will be just now put in the notice. <laughs> Who's ready? Yes, George. Well I mentioned very briefly in my contribution, I said before, at the, that the global survey of business ethics, which is now undertaken in Ukraine. And I think that will provide a wonderful basis for understanding the challenges, the, the challenges and opportunities for business ethics in corporations in, the, in Ukraine. And uh, uh, if, uh, you know, to, to do such a investigation uh, properly, uh, it is important to uh, reach out uh, to many different uh, companies and uh, stakeholders. Uh, it will be a, a, quite a, a big job. But uh, I, I think that uh, that is a, a direction which uh, I certainly want to fully support uh, Yarina and her team uh, because, uh, you know, we, we need some more solid foundation of what are the, the, the problems are in order to build up a curriculum, which is really an answer to those questions. Thank you. Oleg, can you, maybe do you have any ideas? Uh, yes, of sure. Uh, that's a very good question. And I, I would teach that uh, you, you will never be saint as a corporate manager. And uh, you just uh, have uh, uh, to be a good, reasonable person uh, 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 with a good moral compass, firstly, and, and, and have uh, uh, marvelous, tremendous persu uh, persuasion skills, being able to persuade different people from different mindsets uh on uh, on on different ethical dilemmas and uh and be ready to for fail 
uh, in, in this story, because uh, the history of uh, modern companies does tell you that even good companies, they fail in, uh, in, in good ethical decisions uh, and because of different reasons. So we have to, to teach them all this history of bad ethical decisions, bad corporate ethical decisions, and, and then uh, to, uh, to, to make sure that they will be able to persuade and to, to, to find frameworks, again, or create frameworks how to deal with such issues uh, it's because uh, if you don't know what will be a, a, a next uh, ethical issue uh, in future right now it's black and white in terms of ukrainian uh, war but uh, after the five years it can be completely different thank you thank you Oleg. and roman do you have some suggestion for us as business school of Ku? It comes back to one of my previous ideas, which is, uh, I think you should do cross-sectoral courses, business, law enforcement, judiciary, government, where the new, uh, the basics of international business and, as it, and Ukrainian business are made clear to them and help them develop what Mr. Kostuk is uh, describing as the new consensus and a sort of blended common approach to dealing with business ethics. Thank you. Andriy, would you have the last words here? Well, as uh, <coughs> I mean suggestions to you, as a member of the business school, yes, board, I yes. Have your supervisory board you, part of, you, yes. <laughs> you know but as a speaker for today what we have to tell business that uh, basically they really have to take this responsibility of uh, getting new consensus in the country based on the rule of law based on the reasonable based on uh, working hard and uh, looking uh, with sympathy rather than with aggression to other people. Thank Neither you. state, no poor people can do this because they lack either expertise or freedom for developing this. The most free, the most uh, well-informed and the more initiative strata in the society is the business strata and perhaps the academic strata. Those two stratas have to come together to basically reshape this country if this country is going to have a good future. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much for your participation. Uh, we will um, make the conclusion, I think, for the business school and for our business and we'll share it. Um, and we have plenty of work ahead of us building our country. Thank you, thank you so much.